a breakthrough in an end-time prophetic move. Now, I don't know where you stand on end-time prophecy, but you know Jesus is coming back. Amen? Do you know why he's coming back and when he's coming back? Well, when you read your Bibles and you see in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the one sent to you. Like a mother hen longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you were not willing. O Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Jewish people have to come to faith. Something has to happen to bring the Word of God to our Jewish people that they might usher in the return of Messiah. And this is a part of this work. You see, you're making a difference tonight. When you read in your Bibles that Jew and Gentile become one in Messiah, that's exactly what's happening tonight because we are all one in Messiah, man. I've got to tell you the truth because it says the Word of God, the truth will set you free. Amen? How many of you know that your victory is because of the shed blood of Messiah? How many of you know that you bear the mark of the Messiah and the enemy looks at you and he cannot have you? You are redeemed. You are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It was not access to the kingdom of heaven. For the Jew, it was not access for the kingdom of heaven. For the Gentile, it was access for the kingdom of heaven. For all to receive the Lamb of God. You know, I always like to go back, start at the beginning walk you forward to how we got to where we are and where we're going. And we spent the first day, the first session together talking about the sovereignty of God. And some of you were stirred and challenged by that because you hadn't really ever thought about, do you believe in the sovereignty of God? Did anybody ever just ask you that question? Do you truly believe in the sovereignty of God? Or do you believe in astrology or happenstance or circumstance or coincidence or accidental situations? Just uh, two people being, uh, you know, running into each other after many years and, and uh, being there to support each other. Are, they, are those divine appointments or are those just coincidence? And at some point you have to make a decision. Either you believe in the sovereignty of God or you don't. And if you believe in the sovereignty of God, then you know that the master's plan in the beginning was for Jesus to come to the world. That unfolded 1,500 years it took from the prophecy in Genesis about the seed of the woman to the birth of the seed of the woman. Now it's been 2,000 years as the master's plan continues to unfold, it's not quick, it's not simple, it's not instant, it's not microwave, it's not the way we want it to be. How many of you want patience? And you want it right now, don't you? That's it, that's your prayer. Lord, please give me patience and give it to me right now. But we have to wait, and we wait and we wait upon the Lord. So scripture tells us, we wait. And as we wait, what does he tell us to do? He says to study his word, to show ourselves approved of him, to deepen our relationship, to walk along the way, to talk about these things, to speak of them in our homes, to speak of them boldly, to be recognized in the community as the light of the world. And when I see and I read what I see and I read, going on in the world around us, I can't tell a Christian from a non-Christian. I can't tell a believer from a non-believer. All looks the same to me. I grew up in a home where language was very, very important because we were indoctrinated to become Americans. 
So the languages of the people, my family, Yiddish and Hungarian and the other languages are spoken, our focus was English. When you teach a child English, you don't introduce them to curse words, do you? And the first time you ever address those kind of things is either you may have had a slip of a tongue and your two and a half year old in the back seat of the car says it and you say, where did you hear that? And they say, from you, daddy. And you have that rude awakening. Uh, or you hear it out in school or out in the street and you come in and you use it and you're corrected. Well, the community that I grew up in didn't use language like that. There was no um, cursing at all. Cursing is something that God presented to us in the book of Deuteronomy when he set before us blessings and curses, life and death. So cursing, which is what the category of that language falls into, is cursing. Cursing was not something you did. You didn't curse people. You didn't put a curse on a person. Okay? Because there was power. God set before you this day. I set before you blessings and cursings, life and death, choose life. So I didn't grow up with a foul mouth. Even when I did stand-up comedy, the comic before me and the comic after me would use language, but I would never use language like that. So I'm appalled. I'm appalled that we become an America where the mastery of our own language has been degraded to the point where we reach into a bag of dirty tricks and curse words because we can't find a better way to express ourselves. This is what it's come down to. When did we lose the ability to communicate at an intellectual level or raise the bar of society to a standard that we became the example? Didn't Jesus say, while I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world? Now you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine that man would see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. So this whole filthy language, this whole crassness, this whole thing is, it's almost foreign to me because even in the corporate world, I didn't stay in the same hotel as my female employees. After I became a believer, I didn't travel with them. I didn't stay in the same hotels with them because scripture told me to shun all appearance of wrongdoing. So imagine being an executive with Hewlett Packard and you going to the travel department and saying, my team is having a meeting in such and such a city. Okay? They're flying on this flight, I wanna be on this flight. They're staying at the Marriott, the corporate hotel, I'm gonna stay at the Sheraton. And they're going, well, what purpose, for what purpose? I said, because I'm not gonna stay in the same hotel as my female employees. I said, imagine the picture at seven o'clock in the morning, here I was a married man, coming down the elevator with three women who got on from different floors all working for me, and we step off the elevator, and somebody sees that. What assumption are they going to make? That I must have been in their hotel room. So it became quite a discussion point because I set that as a standard, and I refused. I said, I will not travel unless it's under those circumstances. So they finally accommodated it. Is that extreme? Yeah, it sent a message to people that this guy's not fooling around. This guy isn't a guy that's, that's, that's prone to, this isn't the boss that you get flippant with. This isn't the one when, the, when you have the corporate party that uh, people, people hook up. This isn't the guy to work for. If you're working in his division, he's not the guy to work for to try to pull any of that. He conforms to a higher moral standard, so you better conform to that moral standard because he'll call you out on it. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, performance rises. People are focused on the right things. Their lives get better. They don't make the connection, but I do. 
because we're called to be set apart to, to, to set an example. Who are we called to be set apart by? The sovereign one. It doesn't say it's going to be easy to be set apart. As a matter of fact, the, the more set apart you are, the bigger the target you are. The more subject you are for criticism, the more subject you are for slander, for false accusation. But if God is sovereign, then he knows that he will not test you to the point beyond what you can handle. And if you trust in him, you don't have to vindicate yourself. He'll take care of it for you. He sets up kings and tears down kings. He sets up leaders and he tears them down. He's sovereign. It's by his will. If Satan cannot do anything without permission of God, that clearly shows you that God is sovereign. That everything of creation is under his control and authority. And if you believe that, then regardless of the outcome of an election or a circumstance, you're going to trust in the Lord. It is part of the master's plan. Whether it be that somebody's in the hospital and they're fighting for their life and you're there. And while you're there, if you, if you as a believer are bemoaning the circumstance and sound like everybody else on the floor that's wailing and mourning over the loss, the impending loss of life, or you're the one that's praying with and walking in the other rooms and offering to pray for people, and you are the ambassador on <clears throat> the sixth floor in the cancer ward, and you begin to bring a word of encouragement or support in the waiting room to grieving family and tell them that there's hope and ask them if their husband or their child or their wife or their friend knows the Lord and say, I'd be happy to go in and pray for them. That's a divine appointment. Do we miss it because we're so consumed with our own grief or our own circumstances? Do we miss those opportunities that are presented before us? Do we even see them? Do we even recognize them? as opportunities, but as people set apart, we're called to do that. And so as we look at the circumstances surrounding this nation and the decision will be made four weeks from today, God is sovereign. He will have his way in this election. And we have to believe that and we have to trust that. We're examining our founding father's principles and realize maybe for some of you, for me, it was a tremendous realization that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were a summation of sermons. That these were sermon topics being preached by the clergy, the Black Robe Regiment, that changed the course of American's history. Because who ultimately is responsible for leading the flock, for leading the nation? It's the clergy. Look what we've modeled ourselves into now. You have preachers. All they do is preach. They don't have anything to do with the sheep. They don't know who the sheep are. They don't know anything about the sheep. They don't know the sheep's names. Okay? They don't even know what sheep smell like. They don't get that close enough to the sheep because they're just a preacher. Okay? They're not a pastor. They're not a shepherd. They're a preacher. Their job is to come deliver a message. And I equate that to somebody going to a doctor that doesn't see patients but writes prescriptions. You sit in the waiting room and makes you wait an hour in a cold room, sitting on a piece of paper that you wrap presents with, okay, right, tissue paper, all right. You sit there for an hour, nobody sees you, nobody talks to you, and then they come in and say, okay, we've called in this, 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 and this for you. Well, how do you know what's wrong with it? It doesn't matter. Okay, it's the same prescription we call in for everybody, but you have to wait an hour, okay, because we have all these calls we have to make. We're calling in the same prescription for everybody, okay. We don't know anything about you. We haven't examined you, but we don't really care. We've got the answer, and this is the answer, and this is the prescription we're going to write. So isn't that what happens? Because if you don't know the patient, if you haven't examined the patient, you have no idea what's going on in their life, no idea what's going on in their body, but yet you keep, keep handing out prescriptions, all right. Every Sunday morning you give a prescription and then you go back to your office and you sit in your office all right, till the next Sunday and you hand out another prescription. You've never seen a patient all week. It doesn't matter. Okay? You've got the education and the knowledge. And I see this happening all over. 
I see this as being one of the concepts of the megachurches, is they have no contact with the sheep. As far as I'm concerned, a shepherd smells like sheep. Doesn't smell like cologne, they smell like sheep. You know, I had a policy that most people knew at uh, Bethel that um, if we ever grew to the point where I didn't know everybody's name, I would have closed out membership. So that was a point I would know when we got to be too big, was if I couldn't remember your name. If you remember the congregation and I didn't know something about you, know your spouse's name, your children's name, and your name, then we were too big because I, was, I could no longer be an effective shepherd. That was my standard for leadership. I felt that if I couldn't be connected, then how could I shepherd if I didn't know anything about you? When I got that midnight call and you say, and you say, and you're in tears, Sam's in the hospital, and I have to say to you, now, is Sam your cat? Is Sam your dog? Is Sam your son? Or is Sam your husband? Who's, you, would you mind telling me who Sam is? Do you really want to be in that position? So, and I'm not being critical. I'm telling you what we've evolved into. I'm not passing judgment or saying it's right or wrong, but it's what we've evolved into. And so the intimacy of the body has changed. So when do people come together? They come together in crisis. But our founding fathers were very wise in the fact when they made the statement that said that man will suffer evil and tolerate it until that evil becomes too much to be tolerated. So we'll put up with a lot as we have in America, we put up with a lot, a lot of evil. But have we gotten to the point where we put up with enough of it and we're willing to change it? And I don't see that happening based on what I'm seeing, is that we're just going to continue to entertain the status quo of the pervasive evil that runs this country through money. Then we began to dig into, are we of the world or in the world? Which was a challenge. Should we submit to the authority? If the authority is, is uh, so diametrically opposed to the word of God. And how does God define government? And what is God's role in government? And we'll next, uh, over the next couple of days, we'll talk about the history of the good kings and the bad kings, and then finally, what are our responsibilities. But God instituted government for his glory. All things exist under the sovereignty of God and serve not only for the good of the people, but also God's ultimate purpose to bring glory to his name. The most perfect example for you would be the situation with Pharaoh. As Pharaoh's heart began to soften and he began to relent, what happened? And God hardened his heart. Why would he do that? Well, first of all, the 400 years wasn't up yet. So if God let them out early, then God's prophecy to Abraham would have been a, a false prophecy. So that's one aspect, one point of view. Second point of view is, is that you'd be singing a song, Oh, what a friend we have in Pharaoh as opposed to, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus, because Pharaoh would have been the deliverer of the Jews. So it had to happen for God to get the glory. And isn't that exactly the way it's supposed to be? People have had supernatural healings, miraculous transformations in their life, but they keep it a secret because they didn't want to admit they had the problem in the first place, so they don't want to tell of the glorious and major miracle that occurred in their life. How can God then trust them with the next miracle to bring about a praise report, a testimony, and be a great witness for the power of God if when given the opportunity to sing his praises before, they didn't because they, were, they wanted to keep their situation a secret? We get so personally hung up and so personally involved that we miss the opportunity for the blessing. There was a period of time when I was in full-time ministry as a congregational leader that I got ill and wound up in the hospital. 
and the board met and said, um, no one is to know. It'll be very unsettling to the congregation, so no one is to know. So I spent many days in the hospital without a visitor. How do you think that made me feel? So it may have been stabilizing to the congregation, but it was horrendous for me because it was supposed to be kept a secret. This was the board's decision that, you know, it would be too unsettling if they thought you were ill. Then I could never talk about the healing. And then I could never talk about the encounters that I had in the hospital and the people that I prayed with and what took place. Because I was constrained and confined. But they wanted to keep a secret because they had their own reasons. You know, many of you are walking around or living praise reports. But have you ever given the report? Have you ever shared the miracle that God did in your life while you were going through this situation or that situation? Doesn't it say, to God be the glory? And so that's the purpose for many things God does is to bring glory to his name. Read Proverbs 1, 15, 1 and 2, Proverbs 16 and 4, Isaiah 42 and 8. Government, too, has been instituted by God not only for the good of humanity, but also for the glory of his own name. Because if all the governments in the world are set in place, they are a part of God's master plan. He talks about the nations. He talks about the alignment of the nations. He talks about the coalitions that will be forming against Israel. He talks about the armies of the Antichrist, the government of the Antichrist, the one world government. Why? So when they're defeated, God gets the glory. If we take a look at the master's plan and we know it in its entirety, we may not know the tactical, but we do understand the strategic. And it's all to bring about what? The return to the way it was in the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, there was no death. In the Garden of Eden, there was no enmity between man and animal, and man and man, and man and God, and everything was perfect. Well, isn't that the picture of the new heaven and the new earth? Isn't that exactly what's the world to come? Is the world that was? So he's already shown us the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end of what his perfect plan was. He didn't make a mistake in the garden. He gave us the choice and we left the garden, but then he gave us the choice of Jesus so we may return to the garden. So it's one big master plan. It's one huge road map that gives us a starting point which actually takes us around the world to the starting point, which is the finishing point. And so God set it up that way. We can see such glory in both the expression and the limitations of civil government in its universality, sovereignty, and temporality. Leaders change. Some countries have dictators that are in there, the Castros, and I can think of... uh, Um, Some of the other leaders that have been around, uh, the Gaddafis and people like that were in power for many, many years. But predominantly, the nations change leadership, meaning nobody is sovereign. You know, we have a term limit of two terms, so that nobody gains so much power that they become sovereign. They have the same rules in many countries. And so... God is the only one that's sovereign. And there are limits on civil government so that it does not mirror or try to imitate God the same way we did at Babel. So remember, Babel, Babylon means confusion. So God brought confusion in the world so that we could only achieve a certain amount, but we couldn't achieve God-like, even though there are people people who are on the TV every day that think they are God. And quite honestly, many of you, all of us for that matter, would really like to be little gods over something. Wouldn't you like to have just a little bit of control over something so it would go your way, the way you want it every now and then? You know you would. You want to be the little god over a situation. 
You want to be the last word, authority. Okay? That's why I have a dog. Okay? <laughs> and uh, she's my little god because I do whatever she wants. I feed her when she... <laughs> So, you know, you, you can't be a, a good leader unless you're, uh, unless you're a good follower. So I use her as my training ground. And uh, I've learned submission, uh, you know, obedience. <laughs> you know, you learn to read all the signals, all those things. When, when she wants her tummy rubbed, you know, it's real easy. She lays on the floor and kicks me until I do it. Because okay, she's subtle like I am. You know, they say the dogs and their masters, they, they, they resemble each other a lot. It's true. And they say you start to look alike. Okay? Well, she's 14 pounds and black with a red beard. So something's going to change. Either her hair is going to turn white or I'm going to start to look like her. I don't know what's going to happen. You just have to keep coming back and wait and see from week to week. God created the world with incredible diversity and beauty, Genesis 1 and 2. Such variety in creation displays his power, creativity, and glory. Read Psalms 8, Romans 1 and 20. Similar glory can be seen in the diversity of cultures, languages, and government. Variety through the world and government style, form, and function can bring glory to God as long as the particular government in question is operating with God, within God's defined purposes for government. The vast global scope of political authorities is astounding. There's only one nation I can think of in the world that has equal representation for all peoples. What nation do you think that is? Israel. The Knesset, Israel's Knesset, 120 member Knesset, has members who are Arab Christians, Arab Muslims, Ethiopian Jews, secular Jews, religious Jews, Labor Party, Go all the way down the line and they have a coalition government formed by diversity. It's a nation of eight and a half million people. Seven and a quarter million of them are Jewish. One and a quarter million of them are Arab. Some of those Arabs are Christians. Some of those Arabs are Muslims. Doesn't matter. They're all Israelis. And therefore they have equal representation regardless of their national origin, regardless of... And so when you walk the streets of Israel and you see a little Chinese guy wearing a kippah and a black coat and a tallit, and you th think to yourself, funny, he doesn't look Jewish, okay? He's looking at me the same way because where he comes from in Kaifeng, which is a Jewish city in China... It is the last remnant of the Jews in China in a city called Kaifeng. If I were to walk into his synagogue, they would ask me if I was Jewish. And I would say I am. They would go, funny, you don't look Jewish. Well, because you look around the room, okay? I don't look like the rest of the Jewish people in that room. You go to Ethiopia, all right? And Ethiopians are tall, very skinny, and very, very dark skin. And you go to Morocco, and they're French-speaking, and they're Spanish-speaking, and, and the Moroccan Jews look different than the Ethiopian Jews. But they all have, once you're an Israeli, once you're a citizen of Israel, you will be represented. There is no discrimination in Israel. Those who have gone with me, have you seen any exhibition of discrimination whatsoever? Even between Arab and Jew, you have not seen that. Not between Arab and Jewish Israelis. There's a very big difference. Because those who call themselves Palestinians aren't Israelis. They refuse to be Israelis. They have set themselves up as enemies of the state of Israel. But one and a quarter million Arabs chose to be Israelis. They wanted to be a part of the nation of Israel. So... 
the concept that Israel is anti-Arab is completely false because there's representation in their parliament. It's as if they have their own senators representing their community interest. The Druze, which are a particular sect of, of Muslims, a very modern sect of Muslims, very different than all the rest because they believe that the Messiah of Islam would be born to a man, so they wear baggy pants to catch the Messiah in their pants. They have representation. Therefore, diversity. Okay? We're a nation that talks about diversity and equality, but has none. Many of you know that the thing that really flipped my switch was when in the first debate, the expression was used, the black churches. And that just completely was an arrow through my heart. How did we get to the point in the body of Christ that even the body itself is divided by race? How is that loving your neighbor as yourself? How is that esteeming the other more than yourself? How did we get to be so broken and so far away from the word of God? When, if we're all created in the image of God, both male and female, then what color is God? So, in fact, those that discriminate have become little gods, choosing whether or not someone is less than. Remember, I come from a line of people who were called by Adolf Hitler lowest form of life. The lowest form of life. The least deserving of extinction because we were the lowest form of life. Were we not created in the image of God? Are we all not created in the image of God? How did we get here? But when we take a look at the scope of the world and the diversity of the world, Yes, we've had two world wars. Isn't that interesting? Two world wars. And really it was one world war. World War II was just an extension of World War I. But the final closure of World War I was in World War II. How is it that seven and a half billion people cannot just be at each other's throat all the time and killing each other? because there's a part of the world that embraces diversity. And I'm not talking about gays, lesbians, and transgenders, and I'm not talking about that kind of diversity. I'm talking about racial, different backgrounds that live side by side without the discrimination of country clubs that I couldn't play golf at or places I couldn't go because I was Jewish. At the same time, the various governments of the world have geographic, authoritative, and location-specific limitations. Every attempt at global unification under a single recognized authority has failed and will fail until the global diversity of the nation find its ultimate purpose in the worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There will be a counterfeit one-world government, but it will not be universal because I'm not going to be subjected to it. Okay. So it's not going to be all-inclusive. Others have tried. Dictators have tried to take over the world. As a matter of fact, when you look at the empires of the world, the greatest empire, the largest empire in the history of the world was who? Anybody know? The British Empire. They said, the expression was, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Where is the British Empire today? The Falkland Islands, Bermuda, uh, a couple of the Virgin Islands, the UK. I mean, what's the British Empire? It's not an empire. But all the way up until the beginning of last century, the British Empire was the British Empire. Something happened to change them from being the most powerful empire in the world, in the history of the world, to being reduced to the rubble 
of an empire they are today. Anybody know what that was? Anybody figure out what they might have done? Who they might have made mad? Well, I'll tell you that story. The authority and sovereignty of civil government, which is real, even if delegated and limited, instructs us about the kingdom, rule, and reign of God. The exercise of power, authority, and judgment, whether just or abusive, encourages a longing humanity for God's more perfect kingdom. When you look at our government, our government and how broken it is, aren't you seeking something where you can find comfort? Where you can find a message of hope? 55% of Americans are dependent on the government for some form of support. Over half the nation receives some kind of support. Between 5 and 7% of the adult population is incarcerated. Our country's a mess. It's a complete and utter disaster. So the one place we go to to find comfort and shelter is what? The presence of God. So if the message was getting out that the only safe place for you is in the church, the only safe place for you is in the body, the body would grow. But is it safe to be in the church? Or is the church so divided by denominations and by racism that the church hasn't become a sanctuary at all? Now people go for the entertainment, the 30-minute message, and they leave. They don't know each other. They don't know each other's names. They read from Acts chapter 2, but they participate in none of it. Wasn't the whole purpose of Acts chapter 2 that they wound up having everything in common? There's no more diverse people in the Bible than the Jews and the Gentiles. No more diverse. Two completely different worlds. Worlds set apart. Set apart by a wall, a wall of division between Jew and Gentiles that existed for over a thousand years. Very few ever crossed that line over. And when it came to temple worship, It was punishable by death if you brought a Gentile into the temple. The top, number one, breach. Paul was tried for it. And would have been sentenced to death had it been proven that he brought a Gentile. Do you remember he had Timothy, who had a Jewish parentage, circumcised just so he didn't break that law because he knew the punishment was death. But yet, Acts chapter 2 starts out by saying they met together daily in the courtyard outside the temple, Jews and Gentiles, for the first time ever, studying what? The disciples' teaching. They broke bread together. They prayed together. They had fellowship together. They sold what they had and they took care of each other. No one was in want. No one was in need. And they had everything in common. And God added to their numbers daily those being saved. Is that not the model of the church? Isn't that what you hear? Every church will tell you that that's the day the church was born. Was Acts chapter 2 was the birthday of the church. And do we look anything like that today? We don't. I know churches that are called Acts 2. And their desire is to be a mega church. Well, you can't have everything in common. Well, you can have in common if you have a volleyball small group, but your small group is for social reasons, not for the not for the studying of the word. So when we take a look that 
There are limitations. And in those limitations, it should drive us to the need for a relationship with God. When people say to me that they're going through a hard time, a difficult time, a divorce, they feel abandoned, they feel lonely, they live by themselves, they don't have friends, they don't have companionship, I always ask them, what's your relationship with the Lord? If you could have one that will stick closer to you than a brother and never walk alone again, how would you feel about that? Well, that would be perfection. If I had somebody to do something with all the time. So, okay, well, you have that. Can't meet him on match.com. You can, read, you can meet him at bible.com, but you can't meet him at match.com. It's supposed to, the limitations of government are supposed to encourage a longing humanity for God's more perfect kingdom. When we look at how man has ruined everything and God is perfect, what would you seek after? Would you seek after the broken or would you seek after the perfect? It should create a longing in us for something better. That was a crossroads in my life in the, in, when I turned 40. And it wasn't a mid-life crisis. It was a confrontation that I had with the Orthodox rabbis that I sat under. And it had been a confrontation that had been going on for years and finally got to the point where it was <clears throat> so vocal and we were in such opposing sides. And I had spent my entire life learning what the rabbis and being taught what the rabbis had to say. And this is what the seminaries, the Jewish seminaries surrounding Jerusalem were all about, is they each study a particular rabbi and follow his teachings. And so I grew up in that world. And my answer was always, well, that's great, but the rabbi Maimonides or Akiba or this rabbi said that, that Rashi said that, but what does God say? I want to know what God says. And we would sit there and I would get, and, and they would say, well, Rashi said that, I'm done with Rashi. I'm done with these guys. I know all about these guys. I know about Hillel. I've got, I've got 40 years of teaching under my belt. I quote it just as well as you quote it. I quote the Talmud just as well as you quote the Talmud. But I want to know what God has to say. I know what your opinion is. I know what his opinion is. But where is God's answer? And so it drove me from the synagogue. Because they said, unless you want to go and pick a yeshiva and follow a teacher, move to Israel and go to the university there, I don't want that. I want to know what God has to say. I don't want to know what the rabbi's opinion is. I've heard opinions. I've been preached opinions. I've been taught opinions. I can argue everything eight different ways. I can argue for, I can argue against, I can be neutral, I can win, I can, win, I can lose. It's like you playing a, a game of chess against yourself and say, hey, are you winning? No. And so I began to search. I began to search for answers because my statement was, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life than somebody's opinion. Somebody has to have the answer. And so I went on a search for the answer. It, our systems are failed and broken to drive us to God. That's why there is no perfect government, there's no perfect economy, there's no perfect country. Because if there was, then what would we have a need to go and run into the loving arms of our Father? So because of God's sovereignty, there is no country. What's the greatest country in the world? Whatever country you're standing in and talking to, to the person. Oh, France is the greatest country in the world. Who am I talking to? Pierre. Okay. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Russia. Russia is the greatest country in the world. Who am I talking to? And you go on. What do we say? America is the greatest country in the world. Who are we? We're Americans. You ask a Canadian. 
No, Canada is the greatest country in the world. But man's standard of perfection and God's standard of perfection are two different things. And so if you seek after the higher things, it should drive you. The frailties of our system, how broken, how fractured, how corrupt they are, should drive us to God. It's why he allows government to exist. It's why he sets up government. It's why he instituted government. Because he knew the limitations of man. That although they would act like they were gods, they could not act godlike. And there's a huge difference. Right? I'm not God, I just play him on TV. That kind of thing. So the government can, uh, he established limitations on what the government can and cannot do, will and will not do, should and should not do. There is the opportunity for an increased awareness of humanity's need for God and his kingship. Where government is unable or unwilling to promote justice, the perfect justice of God remains holy and satisfying. So where government is unable or unwilling to exercise power and authority for the good and protection of all, the omnipotence and mercy of God remain holy and unlike any other authority in the universe. Man will betray you, God will not. It used to be when you had a problem, you would go to the pastor. That's where you would take your problem to, because you felt safe under the counsel of a shepherd. And we began to develop these mega churches, thousands of people, and you know, some of the people that even go there don't know the pastor's name. Uh, how many of you, you went to church on Sunday, this past Sunday? Okay. How many of you remember the sermon? Okay. About one third of the hands that went up of the people that went on Sunday went up. Okay. Now, I saw people today and I said, hey, how was church on Sunday? Oh, greatest message I ever heard. Really, what was it about? Can't remember what it was about, but it was really, really good. It's supposed to be transformational. It's supposed to be where you come hungry. If you go to a restaurant and you have no appetite, the food's no good. I don't care if you go to one of the James Beard award-winning restaurants. You'll be pushing the food around your plate and just say, you know, it's not, it's overrated. Cost too much, it's not that great. Yeah, because you had three Krispy Kremes in the car before you walked in. But you're hungry? You're really hungry? You know what? Beanie Weenies is gourmet. Okay? Might be the best meal you ever had. If you hadn't eaten in three days, okay? It was savory, it was uh, umami, it was all those things that they talk about, you know? All those things that they talk about. It was all the flavor categories, all rolled into one, and it was beanie weenies. We're supposed to come into God's house hungry, starving for his truth, and come away with a sat our appetite being satisfied but with a longing for more. And government can't do that. God put a limitation on government so government could not replace the kingdom of God. So all earthly authority will ultimately be superseded by the rule of Jesus. See Daniel, uh, Daniel 2 and 44, Revelation 22, 1 through 5. God's sovereign over governments large and small, evil and good, long lasting and short, he makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. Reads Job 12, 23. See Psalm 75, 7. While every earthly government will one day come to an end, God's kingdom alone shall never be destroyed and never end. See Daniel 2, 44. So we need to continue to consider the role of government as set forth in the Bible in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. When the righteous increase in Proverbs 29, 2, the people rejoice. When a wicked man rules, people groan. So we have a responsibility of believers to pray for our leadership. 
I've been shocked that this was not the year of the Million Man March. I've been shocked that there wasn't an ecumenical move across America of every denomination linking arms in every city and every capital city and praying for our nation. I was shocked that this was the year of me waiting to see an evangelical leader rise to the top, vocally calling for the body of Messiah to unite and to change the course of America, to pray for America, for there to be a clarion call for each man, woman, and child to get down on their knees and pray for this country. It didn't happen. Franklin Graham made an attempt to try, but it was city by city, it wasn't a national movement. Didn't, didn't take off, I mean, he had good meetings, but it just didn't happen. I don't know if it's because of the heart of the people are so hardened, or people forget the most simple of statements, prayer changes things. What business is God in? Anybody know God's main business? The prayer answering business. If you hung a shingle out, shingle would say God, okay? Prayer's answered here, okay? He's in the prayer answering business. But we're not praying for the nation. And believers are commanded to pray for their leaders. And it's not that prayer that says, bless them if you can. It's that prayer that God's presence would be made known. And America would turn. Second Chronicles, if my people who are called by my, by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their evil ways, from their wrongdoing. Then I will answer them and heal their land. There's a message to Israel. But if it's wisdom and a message to Israel, how many of you said, hey, you got the same arthritis I do, what works for you? Oh, I tried this, this new horse linen. I said, well, if it works for you, it might work for me. If it worked for Israel, why can't it work for America? Except we're not doing it. We'll get back together again next week. We'll have uh, part uh, eight. There you go. Questions, comments? All right, stand to your feet. Let me send you out with a blessing. Thank you all for being here. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say in this way, I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the Aaronic benediction. Yibarecha Adonai v'yismarecha, Ya'er Adonai panavaleka v'yikunecha, Yisad Adonai panavaleka v'yismarecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen. You are dismissed. If you are, happen to realize this is Yom Kippur, a day of fast, then I hope that uh, if you are fasting, that your fast would be an easy one. Shalom. Behind the scenes of the Middle East conflict rages a biblical battle as old as time. Two seemingly innocent teenagers cross paths and a mystery begins to unfold. Jake Aronson, Jewish son of a U.S. diplomat, has unusual ties to the intelligence community and has savant gifting in solving puzzles, codes, and ciphers. Jake meets Hakeem Baba, a Tehran-born radical Muslim bent on the destruction of the Jewish people and whose father is a Turkish diplomat to the United States. The two of them forge a friendship while in boarding school. 
But during his visits with the Aronson family, Hakim learns of DNA testing to determine Jewish lineage. He also learns of a secret the family has kept for over 3,000 years. Now, Hakim's plans have been discovered. Jake and his team deploy to stop him. Their final encounter brings about a chilling transformation and opens the door to the next installment of The Aaron Chronicles, revealing the mystery behind Aaron's robe. The Codist, The Aaron Chronicles by Eric E. Walker from Tate Publishing. Signed copies available at thecodistbook.com.